It's, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I got the invite uh, from uh, Mr. Doyle and Lance, and uh, my boss asked me if I would come out and speak to you guys briefly about what we do. Uh, but before I do that, uh, let me sort of set the stage here about what we're going to do. Uh, this is not intended to be a lecture. It is not intended to be solely a presentation where I just give you information. What I hope we'll do is we'll use the visual cues as a means of providing a topic of discussion. And as we progress through, you see something that interests you, ask me a question. Uh, with that being said, um, the speaker before me uh, said that he had been around for a while. Well, I am the representative of antiquity. <laughs> um, I started in this business about 1967 after graduating from high school in a little small town in Eldorado, Arkansas. Uh, since that time, I listed in the Air Force. I did 20 years in the Air Force, retired in 1988. And you're probably asking why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this to provide you some depth from which you can ask me questions about this business. Uh, so feel free to ask. Uh, after graduating, um, after uh, retiring from uh, the Air Force in 1988, uh, up until that time, I had uh, pursued a baccalaureate degree, got a master's degree, and long story short, um, I ended up in Italy in 2003, and I was a doctoral fellow in an online degree program uh, from Cal Capella University uh, studying industrial organizational psychology, which feeds into what I do on a daily basis with CAE. So uh, ask questions as we move through this. And uh, hopefully, we can have a very good interactive session. Uh, I don't mean to put my back to you, so I'm going to sort of move around so I get a chance to make uh, face and eye contact with as many of you as possible to let you know that uh, it's OK. Ask a question. Uh, we can do this. Uh, who's, am I controlling the slides? I, I suppose I am. Let's see how we, <laughs> let's see how we do this. Let's see how we're going to do this here. Would you please? OK, it'll make it easier for me. Uh, next slide, please. OK. Um, there was a mention uh, just a few moments ago about Etlink. Now, Etlink is sort of like our grandpa or our great grandpa in this business. Um, what he did was he had an idea to uh, assist in flight training. How many of you have heard of uh, the Singer Sword Machine Company? Singer? OK. We're going to get there. But we're going to get through uh, from uh, Mr. Ed Link. Uh, back in the, the early 1900s, 1927 to be exact, uh, there was a lot of um, consternation about how do we train our newly d developed flight crews to do their jobs uh, and be safe. And Ed Link had the opportunity to be at Wright Field uh, in Ohio back in 1927, and he was witnessing a major auric trying to teach some fellows about a sense of direction and balance uh, that they would uh, incur in the airplane. And so what he did was he took a chair, and he sat one of the prospective pilots in the chair, and he spun it, just kept spinning it. And then he stopped, and he asked the guy which way was he spinning. Well, he had stopped. But he said he was spinning to the right. The point of this demonstration was, invariably, most, about 80% of them got it wrong. And the idea that Ed Link came up with from watching that was, hmm, I'll bet I know how to do that so that they will know which direction that they're turning. So he got the idea that if we take some instruments that would represent straight and level flight, bank and yaw, and let the pilot see it, they wouldn't have to rely on visual cues to know which direction they were turning, whether they were going up or down, straight and level, and that's what he did. So next slide, please. So he did that. And this is representative. This is an actual, the first link simulator that was built back in 1827. Uh, this one is located at McCord Air Force Base in Washington. 
Uh, I used to be the, the site manager there, and I knew it was there, so I asked them for the pictures <coughs> so that they could share it with uh, you to let you know what it looked like. This, this is the actual cockpit, if you will. Uh, and you can see over there the yoke and some instrument for straight and level flight, rate of climb, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is the prelude to current day simulation. So we owe Mr. Etlink uh, a big vote of thanks for doing this because without him, I wouldn't have a job. So I really like this guy. Uh, next slide, please. This is what this has in, evolved into. This particular simulator here happens to be a C-130J. Uh, this is one of the programs that I run. Um, I have the legacy C-130 aircraft and the newer C-130J fan jets. This is a cockpit of one of the legacy aircraft. Now, you see all the instrumentation in here? Uh, I'm going to use two words here, and we'll come back to it, because it'll be, become very important to you as maintainers and researchers and medical professionals later on. These instruments here are actually simulated. Okay? What we did was we took actual aircraft instruments, and with our engineers, we came up with an add-on package on the back of that instrument. It was taking uh, electrical signals, converting them to analog, and making the instruments do what they're supposed to do based on what was going on in the airplane. Now, that is a simulation. You cannot use these instruments in the airplane. Now, this is old technology. It's older than I am. I'm 63. This is very, very, very old. The newer uh, technology is called stimulation. And the difference being, we actually take actual airplane instruments and we provide a signal via an interface, an IO interface, that represents the actions and aerodynamic functions in the airplane and it actually makes the aircraft instruments do what they do in the airplane. The advantages of this, well, as a product manufacturers, we don't have to manufacture that add-on kit to make the instruments work. The other benefit of this is when these aircraft instruments fail and they go back into the repair process, if there are any updates that are required, they're done by the OEM, and in this case, the OEM is Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lockheed Martin and CAE have a long history of partnering, and that's what we do for the C-130 programs. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, a little more about Ed Link and why he's so important to us. I don't think that there is any facet of simulation that exists today that was not influenced by his uh, being proact him being proactive and coming up with this idea to use a man-made, manufactured product representative of something that doesn't necessarily have to be airplanes. In this case, we're talking about the mannequins that you guys use. I saw this thing that gave me a start laying out in the hallway here. Uh, and it's very representative because I wasn't expecting it. And I saw a guy laying there with no legs. Uh, I think it was a butt pressure uh, mannequin, uh, but it, it's real. Uh, it's a device that can be used to simulate uh, medical crisis conditions. And you as health professional will learn to use those to enhance and sharpen and hone your skills. And that's what this area of simulation is all about. Next slide, please. Okay. Let's talk about the guys uh, that I work with. Let's talk about me, because this is where I cut my teeth. Like I said, I started in the Air Force as an enlisted person back in 1967, and I was not always a simulator guy. I was a radio repairman. And being a radio repairman in the Vietnam era motivated you to do something else real quick. <laughs> so after four years of that, I decided that I wanted to ride on the trains because I was stationed at um, uh, Fairchild Air Force Base, and they had these secretive trains that used to pull in in the night, and the pilots would go in the trains, and they'd do their training, and they'd pull out and go again. I'm going, man, that's awesome. I want to do that. So what I did was 
I had to uh, reassess myself, took the test, got the required electronic score, got into the simulator field. Now, this is important because one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit later on is how we train simulator technicians. Well, we used to, uh, and the government did it. There was a specialty AFC called simulator technicians, uh, and that was where, uh, if you were in this field back in the 1960s and 1970, you were part of the elite core because it was a new field. Um, they sent you to school, you did all that, you got a chance to ride the trains, uh, you got a chance to interact with the pilots, and it was a, it was a real good job uh, up until about 1993. Uh, but flight simulator technicians, what do they do? Well, they are the guys that actually maintain and service and produce the flight simulators out in the field. Um, I would liken them to you guys being med techs, uh, maintaining your mannequins, uh, maintaining your test equipment, maintaining uh, those uh, tools that are necessary for you to perform your jobs on a daily basis. Uh, we do it in an environment where we use um, meters, uh, ana uh, analysis machines, uh, we use uh, voltmeters, ohmmeters, uh, a whole host of stuff in order for us to do our job, which is not unlike what many of you do. And I know this because I read, I read a, a brochure about uh, some of the mannequins and how they're produced and um, how they react to certain stimuli, external stimuli that's provided by an instructor. And that stimuli um, in turn causes you guys to react uh, with a, uh, a specific protocol. Well, that's what we do here as simulator technicians. We make sure that the simulator devices are ready, they're ready to go, and the pilots can use them. It used to be that we had a simulator technician in the box. Well, that was back in antiquity where we had to do certain things on a pilot command for the students to uh, uh, receive a certain problem or protocol from which they were supposed to respond to. We don't do that anymore uh, because the technology has advanced to the point where the computer does it for us. So we're no longer in the box with the pilots, it's just the pilots and the students. Next slide, please. Okay, up here, this is our state-of-the-art C-130J fanjet simulator. This is the actual cockpit. If you look out through the windscreen there, you can see the runway. The visual uh, representations have progressed to the point that they are very, very, very real and they're very accurate. Let me share a little story with you. Uh, you guys are familiar with De Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and this is an advantage uh, during the Vietnam era that we didn't have because we didn't have these kind of databases. Uh, when uh, they first started uh, the uh, campaign to enter into Iraq uh, with Desert Storm and Desert Shield, we as a company were already contracted by the Department of Defense to actually build the visual databases for Afghanistan and Iraq. So we did that. And why did we do that? We did that so that we could take our pilots and our other air crew members, place them in a simulated environment, and have them fly that mission to perfection. See, one of the advantages of being uh, a simulator person or a simulator operator or a simulator user is that you can stop in midair. You can look around and have a conversation. You can yell and scream. You can get frustrated. But in the end, you'll get it right. And when you get it right, you save lives. When you get it right, you don't use fuel. You don't use the airplane. So the longevity for our air systems uh, is intact. They stay around a lot longer. I'm going to move on here. So, but this is, this is an actual simulated uh, picture of the cockpit. Uh, that we use. We call this a, a, weapon, a weapon systems trainer, meaning that it has the full uh, complement of parts that make up the airplane in a simulated environment. Uh, for those uh, airframes that use load masters, we actually have load masters trainers too. So we, uh, crew resource management, I heard that word earlier. This is what we do. We keep the crews together, we train them together, and most often, they will stay together for about uh, anywhere from six months to a year if they're doing initial training. 
uh, before they go out in the field. So they, they learn how to interact and communicate uh, as crew members, uh, which in turn uh, enhances their proficiency and it, uh, enhances their skill set. You probably wonder what this little ugly thing is right here. Well, we build these two. And in this particular case here, this is a controls trainer. Uh, these are flaps. You've got uh, landing gear. You've got wing structures. You've got ver vertical stabilators. We actually build these. And we have computer programs uh, that actually run them. So this is for a maintainer to come in and actually uh, create problems, or the instructor will create a problem. And the maintainers have to find the problem. And they do it again over and over and over until they get it right, uh, which is increases their proficiency. Next slide, please. OK. These guys here, I know somebody's going to ask me, and I'm going to stop it right now. No, we do not, start, we do not rotate that fan. These, we, don't, we don't rotate the prop inside the classroom. This is inside a building. What will happen is, uh, when we get to that point, we have a visual representation of the prop rotating on a big screen, like, like we're using here. So they can go through and do all the thing they need to do and get the prop to turn. But this one doesn't turn. They look at the screen to make sure it's turning. But this is an a engine maintenance trainer. Uh, this is where our flight line crews come in with an instructor. And they work every day very, very hard to uh, enhance their proficiency, much like you guys do with your mannequins. Uh, I don't know the full cadre of mannequins that you have, but I can tell you this. You're in the very early stages as a group of people that are going to do wonderful things with simulations in the medical field. And I'm going to tell you how I know that, because I've done it. I was in on the ground floor with, with this program, and I know with the synthetic materials, with the kind of uh, electronics and technologies that we have, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that maybe in 10 or 15 years, you guys have a full walking mannequin controlled by a computer that walks into the room or into a setting like this and has a heart attack, and you guys are supposed to respond. I can, I can, I can imagine that. Because I've seen simulation in the aviation field go from it links little uh, pilot trainer to what we're using today. So you guys are on the cutting edge of a new set of skills that will be used to uh, increase and enhance the quality of life. And I, and I applaud you for that. Next slide, please. OK. The question always come up, what environment does uh, simulator technicians work in? Now, as I said before, I was a simulator technician. I, I started off enlisted, came up through the ranks. Uh, and this is the environment that we work in. It's called a training system support center. And this is just a basic organization uh, chart that I wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, we've got some people here. Let me find them. Uh, see these guys right here? These are the guys that are on the front lines every day uh, responding to issues with maintaining the simulators. They're much like you. These are the engineers, uh, whether it be system guys, software guys, or whatever. They're there to support all of this stuff out there. These guys here, uh, where it says site support, these, these are actual sites. These, uh, these are the actual simulator technicians here that work on the uh, devices that I showed you earlier. These are the guys that use the tools and test equipment to make sure that the simulators uh, are up to uh, their standard of maintenance. And these are the guys that respond for trouble calls. But you need all of this in order to support the device. And the reason you need it, because we're always in an RM mode. We're always researching, developing something. We're always trying to improve the simulator. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, these other guys, because we have an obligation to teach pilots and load masters how to use the function, that's where these guys come in. They, these are the, uh, in fact, Chris is an actual pilot, and he runs a site, and he runs a crew of pilots that train student pilots to do what they do. He also has load master instructors, et cetera. But the point here is there is a training system support center structure available to the technician to provide him with the resources and materials that he needs. 
I imagine that you guys have a similar system like this where you as uh, met techs or simulated medical simulation technicians uh, report to various people within your organizations. If you have problems, you go to one place. If you, have, uh, if you need materials, you go to another place. Uh, if it's a payroll issue, you go to another place. Uh, this is the structure that we have in place uh, on our programs to manage that, and I'm sure you have something like that. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> I said before, uh, one of the questions that I was talking to Lance, he wanted to know, well, how are we trained? Well, it used to be, prior to 1993, that we had this school up at Chinute Air Force Base in Illinois. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Chinute Air Force Base. But this was the premier military training center for those in flight simulation, missiles, ICBMs, uh, and the meteorology. And it was an excellent school. I went to the school back in 1972. And for the analog portion of flight simulation, the course was nine months. That did not include English or it had some math, but none of the social sciences. This was purely <coughs> flight simulation training. So if you, if you convert that into uh, over a year, it's about 960 hours of, of hands-on, uh, everyday instructions in flight simulator. If you did the digital program uh, back then, which was new, then you added an uh, additional three months. So all total, I was at Chinook Air Force Base for 12 months, only doing one thing day in and day out, six to eight hours a day, and that was learning electronics, learning flight simulation, learning aerodynamics, which I'll get into in a few minutes to give you the broad skill set of what s flight simulation technicians uh, must achieve in order to be proficient in their jobs. But up until 1993, we had a place where uh, we could, uh, it was a source for those new technicians coming into the field. Well, lo and behold, BRAC came in, this is uh, government base closures, and Chinook ended up on the list. So they decided to close it for financial reasons. So they closed it. That put a, it just, it just cut the pipeline. Uh, we were going crazy. Where are we going to get our next generation of technicians? So what we had to do was we had to start canvassing the universities uh, and technical schools, uh, non-military, to actually set up programs that taught specific disciplines that would allow a person to become uh, eligible to be a flight simulator technician. Uh, so we, we have a lot of contact with the university. We go in and, and we ask about their programs. We ask if they're teaching uh, aerodynamics. We ask if they're teaching uh, the, the mechanics. We ask if they're teaching hydraulics. We ask if they're teaching hydraulics. And if they're not, what we do, we try to sell the simulation industry to them about the benefits of having programs to generate people uh, that can do these jobs. So we don't have a direct source per se anymore, but we do work with colleges and universities to see if they would uh, promote programs that would allow technicians to come out. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and read these qualifications to you, but basically what it turns out to be is a two-year technical degree in electronics can get you in the door uh, in our, in our, uh, for a flight simulator. Uh, we train you after that, but if you have the basic uh, electronics, we can train you after that because on the average, it takes about anywhere from seven to ten years once you walk into the door to become a proficient flight simulator technician. And I'll, I'll, I'll expound on that in a little bit more. What kind of salary does that pay? Okay, we're going to... I knew somebody was going to ask that, but I, I, I'm prepared for that. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this goes to training. Um, it gives you an idea of what we require in the way of task proficiency. Uh, I developed this training plan about two years ago because uh, there was a little bit of confusion about the different proficiency levels when it came to knowledge, task, and skills. So we wanted to delineate for the technician what the requirement would be for task, knowledge, and subject levels for a particular area. 
And we took this and we flowed it across every skill that we do. So this is a very lengthy uh, task description. Lance has a copy of it. I, I'm sure he'll make it available to those of you that want it. You're all CAE employees, right? Okay, well, this is a CAE product. Uh, it's on our uh, Rio website. Uh, it's there, there's a policy manual that goes with it. But it explains, uh, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. And the reason I, reason I encourage you to do that is because if you've not seen what the requirements for simulator technology is, it might um, give you some avenue of how to structure your own personal training uh, in order to be more proficient. How to do tasks, how tasks are broke down. So I'm going to encourage you, I'm not going to um, expand on it, uh, but I'm going to encourage you to take a, ask Lance for a copy of it, take a look at it. It has a policy book. Uh, and if it's, if it's useful to you, by all means use it because the company provides it. Next slide. Uh, this is just more of the same, and it tells uh, the different uh, levels of proficiency, which is basic, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, and we sp since we have three grades of technicians, technicians one, two, and three, I intentionally did not make that one, two, and three. And the reason for that is it has to do with uh, labor negotiation issues, uh, and I'll get into that when I ask that young man's question in a few minutes about salary. Uh, but next slide, please. Okay. When do flight simulation technicians work? Now, this one is unique in that when you sign a contract with us to be a flight simulator technician, we tell you up front, you have to be able to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, period. And if you, if you can't sign up to that, then it's going to be a problem. And the reason it's going to be a problem has to do with the way our training system is set up. Usually, Usually, from 0600 in the morning till 2300 in the evening, our pilots and students are training. When do we do the maintenance? Most often, it's from 2300 at night until 0600 in the morning. Do we have people on day shift and what we call swing shift? Yes. But they're usually there to provide assistance to the instructor if we have a failed device. They're usually there to do, uh, provide what we call PMs if a device is not being used, but the bulk, 80% of the work is done between 2300 and 0600 in the morning. Now, here's a point to make about that. If, and we have some people that do this, they prefer or try not to work that maintenance shift, guess what's happened to their proficiency? It becomes next to nil. And then three or four years down the road, they're still a tech one, and they wonder why. Well, we just go back to the proficiency guide and say, you've not met these qualifications for training. And it tells you in the training guide where you need to be for a specific skill set. So I say that to say this. Be available to go the extra mile in this industry because you're not always going to have the premium time to do what you need to do. And if you want to be a good medical technician, simulated uh, med techs later on, sometimes it requires just giving a little bit more. But the reward in the end is worth it, believe me. Next slide, please. Okay, Mr. Mann, what your name is? Brad. Brad. Here, let me try and answer the questions about how much are they paid. Now, there is a company policy that I'm not going to stand up here and discuss how we come up with salary. I will tell you this, that if you're not a member of a collective bargaining unit and you have good skills with CAE, you promote and sell yourself. And the company will pay you accordingly. CAE is very fair when it comes to compensation. Now, this is Dorsey talking, but I've been around for a long time. And I think when I look at other companies, and how they structure their compensation, uh, I would uh, say that CAE does a really good job of compensating its employees. But back, to give you an idea of what simulated technicians uh, make, 
And this is based off of what we call an SCA wage. Um, most technicians fall under the category where we call it uh, electronic technicians one, two, and three. And this is from the SCA wage table. Uh, those salaries usually start, hourly, hourly wage usually start, uh, in the case of Minneapolis, the, uh, it starts at 23 and it goes all the way up to $29 an hour. But you have to consider the economics of the region that you're in. So uh, if you look over here at uh, Tacoma, Washington, uh, where I have spent 20 years of my life or more, the salaries are higher. The hourly wage is higher. That goes to economy. You've got Boeing there. You've got Microsoft there. You've got, it's almost an aviation hub. So these guys, uh, they start off at about $28 an hour. Now, I said they start off. What usually happens when you get into uh, labor negotiations, this rate here is a baseline rate, and we negotiate to a point that is anywhere equal to or 10% higher than this. So do the math. Uh, so in this case here, if we say 10% higher, you're looking at probably for a base rate about $31 an hour. That's the start. Questions? Did I answer your question? Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. What do my guys do? And I call them my guys because I love them to death. Uh, we fight a lot about hours of work and uh, but they're good guys, and I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for them because it requires uh, a level of, of ambition uh, that's sometimes an unusual. This is a basic uh, layout of a simulator device, and you see all of these different stations. If you're going to be, a, a, most simulator technicians have to be proficient in hydraulics, in hydraulics. Aerodynamics. Aerodynamics, why? Because we use uh, aerodynamics computation uh, for the flight simulator motion and stuff. And sometimes we get into a problem where we have to go in and troubleshoot uh, RCL circuits or just basic uh, transistor logic circuit, and it has an aerodynamic component to it, whether it be rate of climb, uh, yaw, pitch, uh, rates of trim, etc. So you have to know aer aerodynamics. And another more important than that is, you've got to be able to fly this thing. If you can't fly it to simulate a condition, you're not going to do yourself very well when it comes to trying to troubleshoot the problem. So most of my guys don't have a pilot's license, but I'll, there are a few that I will stack up with any pilot that's flying today. These guys are that good. Uh, some have gone on to become pilots. Most. Well, I wouldn't say most. I would say probably 10 to 15% of them have pilot license. They get them on their own uh, through the commercial venues. But they're good flyers, and you need to be able to do that in order to simulate some of the conditions that we uh, encounter on a daily basis. But back to this right here. Uh, these are the things that we do. Uh, we do I.O. stuff. We do satellite navigations. We do power. This, this goes into uh, uh, your me mechanical and power components uh, for a facility. We do that. I input output cabinets. This is the interface between the actual computer that's sending, sending the signal and the actual cockpit that's using it. Uh, this, this is a big part of what we do and most often we usually have a problem somewhere in here. Uh, the computers are usually pretty stable. The cockpit is usually pretty stable but this is the component that we design as engineers to make all of that stuff work. So if we're usually going to have a problem it's going to be in here someplace. We ha you have to know hydraulics. You have to know uh, the principle of uh, air and air compression. You have to know air conditioning. Yes, we have cockpit air conditioning sitting right here. If this fails, uh, the pilots get too hot and you have to respond. The guys have to go out there and have some idea of what they're doing in order to get the air conditioner back, work, back up to work. Now, are they rated uh, air conditioning people? No. They troubleshoot to a point to know when they call the vendor to service it to tell him what's going on. And when he responds, he responds with the right equipment in order to uh, remedy the problem. But still, as a flight simulator technician, you have to know that. 
this boarding ramp thing here, that has to go with uh, motion and, and hydraulics again. Uh, PCIG, this is our image generator. Uh, this is strictly digital, uh, visual database generation kind of stuff. And this is the uh, electronic, uh, electronic control loading that has to do with the motion. But uh, <clears throat> the point here is uh, there is a wide, wide range of, of skills that one has to have as a, uh, a simulator technician. What does that mean to you? I would imagine that based on how you guys are going to develop a product for increasing your uh, proficiencies and honing your task skills, you're going to have to know principles of what I'm talking about the mannequin now. Heart, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, skin temperatures, uh, eye dilation, and I'm guessing if I, if I get off track, put me back on, uh, about the eyes, ears, and all of this stuff. And believe me, all of that stuff can be simulated, believe it or not. I have no idea uh, of what the components, the medical uh, components will go into doing that, but I do have faith that one day a dummy, uh, I don't mean a dummy, uh, a mannequin <laughs> is going to walk through the door and is going to have a heart attack and you guys as medical technicians are going to be witnesses and taking notes about how you're going to improve that. I see that. And it'll be a very big accomplishment when you do it. I have faith in you. Next slide. Okay. Here is what my guys do. This is test equipment here. Uh, this is bench work. Uh, we have what we call a back shot. And when the guys are on day shift that are not working mids, uh, we put them in the back shop to troubleshoot failed components. Now, when we had the tech school back in uh, prior to 1993, we used to be able to have to troubleshoot down to the component level. That means that itty bitty little diode on the card, we had to be able to troubleshoot down to that. And that's what we were taught. That's why we spent nine months to 12 months in tech school learning how to do. We had to be able to solder, to remove and replace those units up until 1993. After 1993 and the advent of what they call cut off, uh, commercial off the shelf equipment, it revolutionized flight simulation in that it drove the cost way down because it used to be a mill spec that you had to attend to. But with COTS, I'm talking about stuff that you go to Best Buy and Computer World and buy off the shelf. We now use that as a major component to compute our simulation formulas. The price came down, way down. However, the obsolescent went off the roof. Because what happens is with COTS, the manufacturer is only obligated and he'll give you a product statement that after five years, you're on your own, brother. Don't come looking for us to, to maintain it. Don't come looking for us for spares. So obsolescence is out the windows and that's one of the issues that we have. The government, who is our primary customer, keep telling us, you're going to maintain that equipment for 15 to 20 years. And we smile. We go back in the door, close the door, and we look at us and say, ain't no way. <laughs> it's usually five to seven years. And they're starting to come around to that. The costs are down, but the obsolescence is up. So keep that in mind when you're do developing your future mannequins and stuff. When you do your R&M, uh, what usually happens with us is we'll, the customer will come to us with a design specification. We'll start working on it in year one. We'll get the design criteria done by year two. We'll start developing the actual uh, hardware stuff. By year four, when it's ready to go out the door, guess what? Everything we started with is obsolete. So keep that in mind when you're doing your design. Yes, sir? Um, does the government get CAA working on these projects as they're developing a new aircraft? Okay. Yes. What usually happens is, the government has an REM staff of its, its own, and they will team with our engineering and REM staff, and they will actually develop the uh, system specific, specification based on the Air Force's or uh, the military's need. Uh, that's my basic custom of military, by the way. Uh, that need, so they work together. Uh, they are usually paired from cradle to grave or cradle to launch 
of that product. So they are aware of the obsolescence issues and they're feeding this stuff back to uh, their bosses. We're telling our bosses about what might be an issue and we're always trying to work to come up with an alternative or what we call uh, a product that's form, fit, and function. In other words, it, it might not be the same thing uh, by number, but it has the same description, has the same specification, and will do the same job. So that, that's how we try to get around that. Uh, this is the stuff that they use for back in the back shop. These guys up here are completing what we call a PM on some hydraulic uh, actuators. Uh, and what they have to do is they actually take aircraft jacks, jack up the simulator, pull the legs off, and they go through their inspection. It's just like uh, what the airlines do with depot maintenance and stuff. When you, some of you, uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys flew in today. Well, the airplane that you uh, flew in on has a, what they call a periodic maintenance schedule. It flies so many hours, they pull it out of the uh, circuit, they go through it, and they go through every part of it. And that's one thing I like about being in America. Uh, safety is a big concern, as it should be. So we do the same thing with, with the simulators as well. We have PMs that we have to do, whether they be weekly, monthly, semi-monthly, uh, annually, we have to go through them. And this is how we cut down on cost. One of the worst things in the world to happen is for the guys to be up in the box flying, have a hydraulic failure, and it causes um, somebody to get hurt. It, we, we just cannot risk that. So that's why we, uh, we pay uh, attention to our PMs as if, because their lives depend on it. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been in the newer simulations, but it used to be that you could just sit there and just, you know, teeter on and fly. Can't do that anymore. You have to be strapped in just like you're in the airplane because the dynamic, the forces are just the same as in the airplane. We, we do uh, stalls, pitch and rolls, and it will throw you out of the seat. And these actuators are responsible for that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a simulator here, uh, up on full motion. Uh, I provided that uh, as a mean to, after talking about those legs, the one the guys were doing the PMs on, they're back on, they do their system check, they get a green light, we put the box back in service, and the pilots and students continue. Next slide. Okay. This is part of the uh, cadre of tasks that simulator technicians do on a daily basis. Uh, they provide instructor assistance, they provide modification assistance, they do TSSC engineering assistance. Now, uh, let me sort of clarify this. The Training System Support Center is the global infrastructure for where the flight simulator technician does his work. As a part of that, we have an engineering section as a part of that TSSC. And these are the guys that are on call every day uh, to answer questions that the technicians may have or solve problems that the technicians can't. So most of my engineering technicians or engineers or former simulated technicians that you know have gone on, gotten their engineering degree, and they're still working uh, in the TSSC. Uh, I've seen uh, many uh, guys come through the door from a technical school or out of the military. Uh, they come in, they pay their dues. Um, and by the way, CAE has a very good uh, reimbursement poly for education. I've seen a lot of guys use that to get their degrees, so I'm encouraging you, you know, go ahead and get out there, it's there. Get their degrees and they continue to work for CAE. Uh, we also uh, contribute to working groups, and these are some of the working groups that we have uh, on a monthly or weekly basis, the uh, Integrated Logistics Support Work Group, which deals with obsolescence. Uh, we have the Design Change and Deficiency Reporting. We actually have a guy on staff that is a concurrency expert. And what he does is he interfaces daily with the customer being, in this case, the Air Force, and all they do is sit around and talk about the airplane. What can we do to improve the airplane? Well, that's good for us. It's good for us because it generates business. And when it generates business, that means uh, uh, people are gainfully employed. It's good for the customer, the Air Force, because it's increasing their proficiency in order to, for them to do their job. So it's all good. Everybody's work hand in hand. Uh, the TMS land, oh, you guys should be very familiar with this. 
This is your training system maintenance, uh, your land equipment, like uh, what I'm doing up here. I, saw an, I, I would imagine that the young man that hooked me up is part of uh, the IT group here. Uh, that's also big because any more with the simulators, the way we're building them using commercial off-the-shelf uh, equipment, we use a lot of our routing through the TMS and land working groups. We have to go to them and say, okay, give us, a, give us a port to get from this room here to that room in the back. These are the guys that do that. So we, we actually have a group within our uh, infrastructure or organization that manages that, and they work with the sim techs uh, in order to get that done. Safety uh, is always a big concern. And I would encourage you all, as you go about your daily uh, task, to always be safety conscious. Because uh, protecting your life and those of others is paramount to being a good technician. OK, next slide. And this is where we get the questions. So if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask of me, feel free to do so. I'd be happy to, uh, to, to respond. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Oh, I would estimate probably across the program, probably six to ten percent. Yeah, we've got we've got some pretty good SimTech. In fact, my engineering manager, uh, Marcy Salcedo, is ooh, she takes care of me. <laughs> Seriously, uh, she, she's she's gotten me out of a lot of stuff. But about six to ten percent. Now, if you get across uh, CAE globally. That number is going to be much higher, but they're not relegated to being Simtex. That's you get into the other engineering pools and stuff. Yes, sir. I noticed on a couple of the pictures you showed of the different uh, simulators, some of them had flight had simulated flight control services. I mean, there was shape like airplanes. Mm -hmm. Does that add to the reality? I mean, was there anything added? Why why did they have wings and tails? Okay, because when you're dealing with flight controls. We actually want the technician to be able to go out, or the student to be able to go out and look at a replica of the flight surface that they're working on. So that one model, uh, that was a flight control trainer. So we, we've got flaps there, we've got ailerons, we've got the wing uh, structure. So they can, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a visual aid. And it's also a functional visual aid. Because the instructor might say, uh, did you uh, put safety wire on point three? of section yada, yada, yada. Well, he has to go up there and physically look to see if he did that when he was performing his task. So that, that's why we have them like that. And the one that you saw, we actually took, uh, this is, um, we have what we call FUT devices, which is a fuselage trainer, where we, the Air Force or a customer will give us their particular airframe uh, for the load masters to learn how to manipulate uh, and become proficient with the interior. We just cut the wings off of it, hooked some, some computers up to it to make everything work as it should and use that. That's a cost saving because they, were gonna, gonna, they weren't going to use the airframe anyway. So we use it that way. I saw another question. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that, that's a very good question. And remember the, the task sheet that I showed you? Uh, go take a look at that. I'm gonna answer your question. Uh, there are basics that, uh, there are commonalities across all the different uh, devices. Uh, electronics is electronics. What most often happen is there is a familiarization phase that a technician coming from one device to another has to go through. And that's a part of their task proficiency. The computer operation, how computer works, remains the same. It's just understanding the application for a particular device. So we make provisions for familiarization. Part of our task list has a familiarization in it. But that task list that I showed you is for all CAE simulator technicians. 
You can take that task list and overlay it on any device that we man. <coughs> it will work. You'll just change the name of the different components, but the basic principles and tasking remain the same. If you're doing a power up on a C-130J, sure, it's gonna be different than the power up on a KC-135 in what the switches are called. But the sequence is usually the same. You start from point A, which is the power being off at the wall, and walk it all the way through until the device is up. There's a sequence. And lucky for us, we as a company generate those manuals of operation in our facility at Tampa. So we've got, they're not simulated technicians, they're just technicians, period. They're tech writers. And they go back through our archives of, of operation procedures to make sure that they are being consistent with how we develop those procedures. So it's applicable across the board. Yes, sir. Jesse, I have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship uh, between the educator, the person training the other pilot, and the technician with regards to the process of the operation of simulation itself? OK. Um, most often, the, the pilots are, have the uh, wherewithal to direct what's going on in, in the actual flight simulator, the actual training. Uh, a session. The relationship of the technicians to that is to respond on demand to requests from the, from the pilot. Let me give you a good example. Let's say the pilot is trying to set up what we call an uh, addish, uh, initial condition set for a takeoff from uh, Las Vegas. He goes in, he punches the IC1 that was supposed to bring up the data set for Las Vegas. He punches it, nothing happens. He's on the radio, he said, I have a, a uh, request for assistance. The technician goes up, they talk out of earshot of the students. The pilot tells him what the problem is, the technician makes a snap decision of what he needs to do to get that IC working. If he doesn't get it working, then it's up, the, it, the impetus is on the, uh, the flight simulator technician to know the operational schedule for that entire day. So if you had to remove that crew from that device because it doesn't work to another device, he has that authority on the spot to do that. So it's a very close working relationship. It requires a lot of synchronization and very, very good communication. And it sounds like a lot of respect too. It is, there is. Okay, if that's the last questions. Uh, Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you.